those non-traditional risk factors, um, there's some evidence, we don't have to go through the, the specifics here, but there's some evidence for reduction in, in inflammation um, in, in chronic kidney disease and a little bit of extra, uh, evidence for reduction in oxidative stress. So, um, you know, and these are all mixed studies. Some of them are done in non-dialysis or pre-dialysis patients. Some of them are done in hemodialysis patients. So it's kind of a mixed bag uh, of all these different studies. So um, we were fortunate enough to get a little bit of money from National Institutes of Health to do a, a, an exercise training study, a randomized training study. Um, and folks were randomized either to receive 12 weeks of exercise training or into a control group, but what I'll tell you about the control group is that everybody got exercise at the end of the 12 weeks. So we didn't withhold exercise from anybody. Um, so um, they did 12 weeks of exercise, three times a week they came in to see us, and we used this moderate intensity um, heart rate reserve method. We did an exercise test on everybody. Um, so we knew what their true maximum heart rate was and their resting heart rate was. Um, and they were able to, to exercise on a treadmill, upright bike, recumbent bike, or elliptical. So they had their choice. Okay. Um, so the good news is that we got people to come in and exercise, right? So, um, you know, some, some of the comments about exercise with, with folks is that, well, they're not going to do it anyway. Well, they, they came in. So this is, um, our compliance was 92%. So it means that on average patients came in to 92% of their visit with exercise, which is, which is pretty good. Um, we started them off at a, a, a shorter duration and then worked them up. And you can see that by about six weeks, you know, we were up to about 40 to 45 minutes of exercise in most people. And then if we look at intensity, we started at a lower intensity and we were able to ramp folks up, you know, to slightly above 70% of their heart rate reserve. So, you know, we were able to give them a dose of exercise um, that we felt was appropriate. So um, this is kind of hot off the presses. We just finished the study. Um, so VO2 peak in the control group, no change. In the exercise training group, it improved significantly. If we just look at exercise time or how long they were able to go on the bike, um, we, we see this improvement. Um, and what's kind of concerning is even in 12 weeks, you, you see a little bit of a decline here in, in exercise time. It's not significant, but it's, you know, it's kind of something that we see. So they're able to improve their exercise capacity, their ability to do, to do exercise. So my lab is we're really interested in kind of this, what, what explains potentially the increased cardiovascular risk in kidney disease. So our interest is in vascular physiology. So the endothelium is just a, a thin one cell layer uh, in our blood vessels. It's very important for maintaining uh, blood vessel homeostasis or blood vessel health. Um, so it regulates whether cells can stick to that vessel wall, inflammation, uh, vascular tone, so it's important in blood pressure control and so forth. Um, and the molecule that appears to be most important in this is called nitric oxide. Um, so that's pr predominantly responsible for maintaining that vascular health. So um, we are able to, to make some measurements of endothelial function in humans, and we were tr what our question really was to see if does exercise training improve that? Um, and maybe that w could be uh, an explanation for how exercise may be beneficial in these folks. So just very quickly, I'm not going to get into too many details, but we can measure uh, endothelial function with ultrasound in the brachial artery. So if we just measure the, the brachial artery here, if we inflate a cuff distal to that for five minutes, we release the cuff, that increases blood flow here that should cause a dilation of the vessel. And that dilation is predominantly nitric oxide dependent. So it's just a simple calculation of the peak diameter that we observe with the ultrasound minus what we started with divided by baseline and we get a percentage. Um, and then this is just a picture of um, the lab group doing those measurements. And in general, um, here's a baseline image and a peak. You can see the increase in blood velocity here that you get after you release the cuff. Um, but that flow media dilation is lower in chronic kidney disease. There's a number of studies out there um, that have shown this, that this is a fairly consistent finding. So when we did our exercise training study, um, this data is kind of interesting. So this is the control in the exercise training group again. Um, we see that there's actually a decline in the control group. Um, this didn't reach significance in the exercise training group, but um, we see a, a slight improvement there. So there's at least a, main, a maintenance of function uh, in, the, in the exercise training group. And I should back up and say, I didn't tell you this, that there's 15 to 16 patients in each of these groups. We talked to over 
Danielle can tell you, over 350 people um, to get those 30 people. <laughs> so um, it, it, it took us a while to do that. The other measurement that we make um, is in the skin. So we use the skin as a kind of surrogate for microvascular small, small blood vessel function. So what we're able to do is um, if you heat the skin, you get this increase in, in uh, cutaneous vasodilation or, or, or vasodilation or blood flow in the skin. Um, and this secondary um, kind of plateau that we see here uh, is what we're really interested in. And we know that if we give it, an, if we infuse an inhibitor of nitric oxide into that, we can drop this um, way down here. So that's, it's a nitric oxide dependent mechanism. So we're really kind of getting a, a bioassay of that nitric oxide that we know is really important for blood vessel function. Um, so this data is, is very interesting as well in that in the control group, no effect, but in the exercise training group, we see an improvement there. Um, we're actually able to infuse a variety of different things into, into, those, uh, into that site. And we've, we've done some antioxidant studies, and we show that we can improve that function with antioxidants uh, in a CKD patient. After training, we actually see that those antioxidants actually may cause a decline, which is what you would see in a healthy person. because no, uh, Some amount of free radicals are important for normal function. So we, we think that we're improving exercises, improving the, the, uh, the redox balance or, or the reducing oxidative stress to some degree, some degree there. So we're still kind of teasing through some of that data. So the other side of this, we have the increased cardiovascular risk, but there's also muscle wasting. So there's a loss of muscle mass that happens. And there's a variety of different potential causes for that. Um, malnutrition, uh, there's comorbid conditions, inflammation, resistance to some hormones that are important for maintaining muscle mass, dialysis process itself, uh, acidosis, and so forth. And then if you're physically inactive, that doesn't add to the, that kind of adds to the problem, right? Um, so the question then is, um, what about resistance training in, in individuals with kidney disease? So there's the potential that um, they might be resistant to the anabolic effects of exercise uh, because there's some insulin resistance and there's some problems with growth hormone uh, and so forth that may, may limit the ability for muscle to grow in response to exercise training. So what we mean by anabolic is just muscle growth. And there's also a lack of any kind of prescription parameters that may be most effective at increasing size and strength in these patients. There's just, there's just very limited data out there. So I'm going to present a study that was done by Danielle Kirkman, who was a postdoc in the lab when she was in, in Wales. Um, and they did a very unique study where they actually did leg press exercise in the dialysis clinic. So this is a leg press machine just pushed up to the bed. And they were doing um, leg press exercises while they were at the clinic. So in Europe, they do a lot of this intradialytic exercise um, in the clinic. It's, it's a very common uh, finding over there. So um, they're doing leg press exercises here. So they're doing three sets of 8 to 10 repetitions at 80% of their 1RM, their maximum uh, that they can do. And they did it three times a week for 12 weeks. They had a control group that got a, a TheraBand, just elastic bands, um, and some stretching exercises. So the first question was, are they able to actually increase their strength or their training volume like a, 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 a non-CKD patient would do? So they had healthy participants in blue here and hemodialysis patients in red. And what you can see is that although there's, the training volume is lower uh, between these two groups, but the, the slope of this line is the same. They both increased their training volume by about 90%. So they're, they're able to get stronger. They did some MRI measurements. Um, and you can see that in the, in the exercise train hemodialysis group and in a healthy group, they both increase their muscle mass. And when we look at change in knee strength, you can see that the uh, hemodialysis group and the healthy group both increase their, their uh, knee strength. So there's evidence that you can increase muscle mass and strength in these hemodialysis patients. The interesting thing about this study is that it didn't translate to improvements in physical function. So, um, you know, what's happening there, we don't quite know. Maybe you need to combine that with some endurance exercise in order to see the benefits of physical function. So maybe combined, uh, combined training may be important. So this sedentary lifestyle, physical inactivity, we really don't know what's the best intervention, what intensity to do. Um, 
there's the non-dialysis groups versus hemodialysis or PD patients. Um, maybe they have different, there's a lot, there's, there's not enough studies in either one of those areas to make um, any kind of conclusions about one or the other. And then what's not even considered here are nutritional concerns. So there are some folks that are trying to combine, you know, um, some nutritional interventions with exercise and hemodialysis patients as well. So there's data to show that, um, you know, CKD patients are sedentary nearly two-thirds of the time, okay? Um, and that if you trade off that sedentary time with light activity, that's not a whole lot, just light activity, not that moderate to vigorous, just a little bit of light activity, uh, that reduces the risk of death, okay? Clearly, we need some larger, long-term studies to figure out some of these things. But if we know that just a little bit of exercise does something, um, we should, probably should just get started. So what we've done, um, we, we did our, this randomized study, small randomized study. We had some patients that didn't qualify that really wanted to exercise. We had patients that exercised that wanted to keep exercising with us. Um, so we decided that we would start a, um, a small renal rehabilitation program at the University of Delaware. And really, this is, has um, started just about a year ago, and it's spread by word of mouth for the most part. We really have done no advertising for this. And in the last year, we've probably gotten about 80 or so referrals and had 40, about 45 patients start with us. Not everybody stayed, but um, so we've had wait lists at some points because we just didn't have enough hours in the day to see everybody. So what this does is it gives access to regular supervised exercise for patients with kidney disease. Um, and all kinds of patients, so uh, non-dialysis, CKD, dialysis patients, transplant patients. Um, Dr. Swanson's group likes to send us the transplant patients to make sure they take care of their kidneys when they're, when they're done. Um, and the, the important thing here is that we individually tailor the exercise to the patient. So not everybody walks in the door with the same physical activity, to, physical capacity to start with, right? Um, we have, you know, clinical exercise physiologists there. Um, the neat thing about our program is that we also have master's students that are training as clinical exercise physiologists working in the, in the, in the program. So they're learning. Um, they learn a lot from the patients. The patients learn from them, and they're overseen by clinical exercise physiologists. So it's a nice um, program that way and allows us actually to do it at no cost to the patient because it's an educational experience for the students. Um, and then before anybody starts, we require that they have physician's clearance. So some of the physicians in the room may have seen that form come across their desk that we ask for. Um, so what we've done is we've started to collect a little bit of um, physical function, quality of life, and symptom data in these folks. Because what we've realized is that although I'm really interested in blood vessel function, the patients are really interested in their quality of life, their physical function, and, and their symptoms, right? So we, are we helping in that area? And I think that kind of fits with today's theme, right? Um, so this is, um, we have a lot more data at baseline than we do at three and six months because we've only been going for a year. But what you can see here is six-minute walk distances are improving, timed up and go. They're getting up from that chair. They're walking three meters. That's um, going down, so that means they're doing it faster. That's better. 30 minutes sit to stand. How many times can you get up and, and, and stand and sit back down again from a chair? And this is a demonstration here. Um, the number of repetitions has increased. From, from being in the program. So physical function appears to be improving. Um, there's also some quality of life questionnaires that we give folks, and there's a, a whole host of different questions. And we really don't have a lot of data yet, so kind of parsing out the individual components of that, we're not quite ready to do, but you can group things together into kind of physical function and general health. And what you can see is that physical function, these are self-reported or subjective measurements of uh, physical function uh, is improving. Perception of general health is improving. So the quality of life perspective appears to be improving. And then lastly, we give them the kidney symptom questionnaire um, and ask a series of different uh, common symptoms. Um, we heard about some of those symptoms uh, earlier. Um, and what we did is we just kind of um, accumulated the, the frequency of total symptoms because, again, we don't have a ton of data yet. But you can see that, that the number of symptoms appears to be going down. So, you know, we feel like the patients seem to be benefiting from this. I think they're going back and they're telling other folks that they're, they're feeling better and we're getting more referrals, and it's really been word of mouth um, so far. So we're going to continue to do that program. Uh, we've been able to open up some more hours. We're actually 
If anybody's been past the University of Delaware campus recently, you see a tower going up in the background down the Star Campus. We'll have a bigger facility there, so we'll be able to see more patients at the same time. So we're hopeful that we can kind of continue this. Um, Delaware's a small state, so we're hoping that we can, you know, impact as many patients as possible through the, the rehab program and maybe expand to other, to, to other places as well. Um, so I thought I would just end with just some kind of general exercise recommendations for CKD. And again, there's no place where you can go and, and say this is the recommendations for kidney disease. Um, we've kind of taken the recommendations out there and adapted them for, for, for that. So really, I think the first thing is just check with your physician first, right? We know that cardiovascular disease is, is prevalent in um, kidney disease, so, and there may be some other conditions that may preclude someone from exercising. So make sure you get clearance first. Um, at minimum, start with some kind of aerobic exercise. That could simply be for going for a walk in your neighborhood. Um, and then add these other things, resistance, flexibility, and balance training if possible. I'm not going to talk about flexibility and balance, but those are also important. And again, we go back to the, in the, the clinical guidelines, it's in there. This 150 minutes per week is in, is in the guidelines. So let's, hopefully we can try to get more patients to do that. From a, an aerobic or endurance training perspective, right, this is right out of the guidelines, right, ideally five or more times per week for 30 minutes. Try to get those 150 minutes. And if you need to, to figure out intensity, we use that reading of perceived exertion of 12 to 15 in a moderate intensity. What we know, though, is that lower levels can also be beneficial. So just doing something is better than doing nothing, right? Um, if you can't do 30 minutes, do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, and start with 20 minutes so that you can kind of start slowly. Um, if there's access to a supervised place to do resistance training, again, this should be supervised at least initially. If you've never done any resistance training before, you shouldn't go to the Y and start, you know, trying to throw some weights around. Um, two days a week is probably enough on non-consecutive days. Again, you know, try to do that at a moderate intensity, right? You shouldn't be killing yourself um, lifting weights. And target both the upper and lower body groups, right? If we just target the lower body, that's great for walking around, but activities of daily living are going to require us to use our upper body as well. So from a safety considerations perspective, right, um, there's some general safety considerations we can think about. Make sure you get con uh, physician um, consent. There are some contraindications to exercise, right? So we want to make sure that um, either the, 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 your physician or um, exercise physiologist, someone you talk to that before you do that. If you have diabetes, make sure you're monitoring blood glucose levels. We do that for everybody in our clinic. Um, Warm up and cool down is important. Any medications may, that may blunt blood pressure, heart rate is important as well. And then in dialysis, there's some, some other unique challenges, right? Um, we do have dialysis patients come to, to see us. They usually come on Tuesday and Thursday because they're dialyzing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The home folks can have a little bit more flexibility. Um, so if it's in a dialysis clinic, and that I don't know that there's any of that happening in Delaware, um, but avoid exercise in the first and last hour. Um, Monitoring blood pressure is important for looking out for drops in blood pressure, um, cramping, and then make, make sure of, of understanding fluid restrictions if, if people become thirsty. And then avoid exercise in these other condi conditions. Um, so again, this is probably not as uh, intradialytic exercise as, as I just don't think anybody's doing it in Delaware. We would love to work with somebody to do that, um, but I don't think it's quite, quite there yet. So I guess I will end with um, just this. Try to get more active if you're not active. Um, and recommend exercise and physical activity to, to, to patients. And one last thing is Danielle Kirkman, really, if, if you're in our renal rehab program, Danielle is really driving that. I have a full-time faculty job, too, so Danielle does lots and lots of work there. Um, I'll be Another person to give a shout out to Nephrology Associates. They've been great helping us with recruiting for our, um, our, our studies. And these are all former and, and current students that have, have, uh, have helped out in the lab.